Thank you again, and um, uh, it's nice to be at the ACBS, and uh, it's an amazing effort by Srinivas Kumar, and I compliment him for that. Um, today I'm going to use my experience from CTOs, calcified lesions, uncrossable lesions, and try to give you some, just five things which are basic, which can be used in everyday practice, really. Um, we all know that calcium really hinders uh, crossing, whether it be with wire, with balloon, with stent, and whatever. And when we have previous failed attempts, acute bends, cutoffs, and uh, long lengths of uh, occlusion or plaque, then this uh, difficulty is uh, compounded. And as we add one to the other, you can see that the time required to cross with the wire will keep increasing to a point where when you have uh, a previously failed attempt and a cutoff and an acute band with calcium, sometimes it may take as long as two hours to even get the wire inside, and that's important. Um, and this is a slide which just says that as we go to the right of the slide and the co more complex the lesion, you're going to have difficulty even crossing the wire initially. My current practice in CTO is to um, start with a Fielder XT with a fine cross or a Corsair and go to a Conquest Pro or an Ultimate 3 depending upon the size of the artery, the straightness of the artery. In a tortuous disease of the artery, I'd go to an Ultimate 3. Um, and then, of course, um, we do a parallel wire at some stage, and if you find that that is sub-intimal, we'll have a low threshold to go retrograde, and then we try to do an IVUS guided completion of the procedure. So what is the difficulty that is imposed by calcific plaque? First difficulty is basically to the guide wire. We still do not have a guide wire which is strong enough to penetrate any type of calcium, be it a Conquest 1820, it cannot penetrate calcium. So wires cannot penetrate calcium, and that is clearly shown bench as well as in patients. The calcium needs to be circumvented. That means we have to have a way around the calcium. So the wire needs to be penetrative, it has to be deflective, and it has to have a one-is-to-one -one linear torque with deflectability. So that will help the tip retain shape as well as manure. And if I have to kind of make a cartoon to represent what I'm trying to say to you is we have to find with our wires a path within the CTO path. So within the artery which is occluded, there's a definite path which is tortuous, which lays within, and the ideal wire would be a wire that can be deflected successfully to remain within that path. And this is shown by this cartoon that I kind of made to make that point. This is an occluded segment of the artery, and here is the path which you might have to follow for a successful wire negotiation. And you would have to have a wire which can be deflected off these sides well to cross it. And this cannot be achieved with the current wires which, are which we have in our armamentarium at this present time, but we hope to get them. To make this point, so tip number one is choosing a wire. Here was a 40-year-old gentleman who had an occluded right coronary artery and an occluded LAD, did not want surgery as a choice. So we accepted, and once we had done the L RCS CTO, this was the LED CTO, totally, a totally occluded artery over a long period of time, um, short stump, a right angle takeoff of the LED, and, and, and an abrupt closure with a tapered end. We tried with the Fielder XC wire, <clears throat> and the Fielder XC wire got a, purchased a little bit into the lesion. And once it went in, we realized from retrograde injections that we'd gone far as this major septal branch. But if you look at this artery now, the fielder did not want to do any more. The fielder XT has a weak tip. It doesn't have the same torque control as you would have from the Miracle Brother wires, but it's a great wire because it has been shown that it can actually work even when Conquest Pro fails sometimes. <clears throat> so we needed something that would take a right angle over there and then take a second right angle leftward. So we needed a wire that could maneuver. So a simple thing like understanding your wire so that you can choose a wire that would maneuver well, we move to an Ultimate Brothers 3 because that has better maneuverability with better support than, this pay, than the Fielder XT under the circumstances. So with the Fielder, with the microcatheter in place, we change for our Ultimate Brothers 3 with a tip which was 45 or a little more bent, and you can see the tip is a little deflected. And then we've gone into the artery successfully. But then comes the next problem, that the guide wire crossed, and the guide wire was done, 
But once the guide wire th was there, you can see the corner over there, we had nothing crossing, no balloons would cross this lesion. And what we ended up using was in the left top corner there was a tornus device to cross to the lesion and then complete the case once the channel was formed. Um, tip number two is, Ajit just mentioned it, is uh, this is a case that comes out from, a, from our library of cases where we had a right coronary artery which was rather difficult, a CTO which has been attempted twice before by an operator. The anti-grade approach with a Conquest Pro wire did not want to make any gain into that CTO. So what we did was we went and anchored this with an anchoring balloon, as you can see up there, um, the anchoring balloon in the conus branch that allowed a penetration into the lesion, but um, beware that when you start using support balloon occlusions to support your guide catheter, the feel of the wire is rather lost because you end up absolutely making that wire stronger and your maneuverability is lost. And sometimes you can easily go into a false lumen and advance quite rapidly into a very unknown and unwanted area as would have happened in this case as well. Um, and then we had to quickly move on to a retrograde approach for this because we had a distal wire position which was not favorable, was not interluminal. And so we kept that wire parked in there, went extra, and, and what happens then? While you have this balloon here inflated, you are okay because your guide catheter, your relative distance between your guide catheter and your balloon remains constant. But you know, when you start getting a wire anti-gradely and now you've got to go and deliver stents, you cannot have this balloon sometimes waiting there. So you actually take off the balloon and you realize that you can have aortic dissections. One big tip that I want to learn, I mean, leave back over here is when you see the staining happen, do not inject into that guide catheter. What I do is, and I don't have it recorded here, but I leave that guide catheter, I pull it out of the ostium, I puncture the other side, I already have a punctured other side because it's a CTO, what I do is I put in a diagnostic catheter into this right coronary artery, let the angiography be guided by the diagnostic, and use your guide as a conduit for your stents to place them and complete the procedure. If you were to go ahead and inject this, there are two ways this can go. You could either advance this dissection in hematoma into the right coronary artery, or worse, and I've seen a patient doing that, is you could actually advance this dissection in the aorta as far as the carotid artery, causing major strokes and other hemodynamic compromises. And this is something nasty. And if it goes down into the aortic valve and disrupts the base of the aortic valve, you can have acute AR, and that is a surgical emergency. Um, very important. One of the biggest failures, as I pointed out to you, is calcium. And here is a patient who we had um, uh, with a right coronary artery, which is totally occluded. And our assessment over here was that this is going to be rather difficult to, uh, to cross because of the calcium that's there in the path and the, and the bend. And we identified, and the, and the maroon line here identifies what we think was the path which could have brought us success. But the green dots, you can see that extensive calcium which is in the way. Uh, despite our e efforts, um, sometimes we're just not able to cross. And this is one of our three failures from retrograde procedures. Because nor were we able to get a corset across the septal path in, in spite of dilating it, nor were we able to get across. So we can be stuck at the wire and sometimes we need to know when to withdraw and not pursue anymore before we get into trouble. And that's important. And we had tried everything. As I told you, something that has helped me is this is a kind of a garden variety lesion. I didn't see much calcium on fluoroscopy, a right coronary artery which was rather difficult. And uh, we put in an anchoring balloon in the conus branch and that anchoring balloon did not support us, advance any 1.2 balloon or anything in there. Even the microcatheter wouldn't go. So uh, what we did was, and this was an earlier case, is we took in a Corsair and the Corsair, we nudged the nose of the Corsair tightly, firmly into the lesion. And when you nudge the lesion, in, into the lesion, you can then exchange the wire for a rotor wire. And once you have a rotor wire in, it's easy to go ahead and do a rotational arthrectomy using whatever burr size you think right. And once that is done, completing the case is not difficult at all. Um, 
a similar, I mean, this is something I've shown before, and I want to show that this, the same technique can be applied extensively to various anatomies. And this is a 65-year-old, status post CABD, six months, presented with unstable angina, vein grafts with the RCNOMA patent, and this Lima to LED showed a nasty lesion in the LED, and this was attempted in all kinds of balloons. I mean, we tried all 1.2 balloons, we tried a tonus 2.1, a 2.2.6, nothing would cross. So what we ended up doing was we did that corn, we did the core shape, nudged it into the lesion as far as it would go, removed the original wire, put in a rotor wire, advanced the rotational ethectomy burr manually right to the lesion, activated it, did a 1.25 burr into that LED, and then at 190,000 revolutions, um, and, and then completed the procedure with two stents, and this patient got on well, is doing okay long term. Um, this difficulty is not just CTO, but the experience from our CTO cases we've drawn and some of our non-CTO cases we've started viewing like a CTO itself. And here is one of those cases, which is an elderly man who, who had a bypass done around eight years ago. The lemur to the LED has, the, the lemur to the LED has failed, and he is now symptomatic from this LED lesion, which is quite viable. And this is a nasty left main LED takeoff. It's a right angle takeoff. It's a near total occlusion, heavily calcified. And this is a risky lesion to start because if you were to go and raise a flap in one of these cases and acutely close this LED, you could have hemodynamic instability. So it's very important to make sure that wire positions are good. We're very careful in nudging a wire. And what we did was we got the wire with a little bit of maneuverability. We got the wire in place. But what happens next is that no microcatheter and no balloon would go, and we could cross nothing. Uh, we tried everything. We opened all the balloons in our lab, and we could do nothing. Eventually, we, we tried a tornus device here. The tornus did not have the ability to take that acute right angle bend and still maintain the momentum of engaging the lesion. And in this particular case, you shouldn't try too hard with the tornus, because if you try too hard with the tornus, you could actually unwind the tornus within the coronary artery in the left main, making it a surgical emergency. So this is something that I wouldn't do. So what I did was, I took a 1.25, uh, a sprinter legend over the wire balloon. I nudged it into the lesion as far as I can, and if you believe me, remember that this now, this balloon is inflated at 20 atmospheres in this lesion, and I could see no, no balloon dilated there. So at 20 at atmospheres, this balloon was not capable of dilating this lesion, but what it did is it held the balloon in place for me to then remove my wire and replace it with a rotor wire. And once I had my rotor wire in there, I took in a 1.25 burr, upgraded it to a 1.75 burr, and then completing the case was not difficult at all. Um, in our STEMI patients, I, we have discussed this, and you can see the prospect. I mean, when you look at the trials and when you look at the data, if you look at the Horizons AMI and you look at the various trials, you see the large part of the acute AMI patients where the thromboaspiration device does not cross. And there are these very heavily calcified lesions which are difficult to cross. Here is a 62-year-old gentleman with anterior wall ST elevation myocardial infarction of three hours of duration. Our typical practice at this present time, and this now we have around 21 cases like this in our practice of ST elevation myocardial infarction where nothing would cross. Um, we give them IV low molecular weight heparins, uh, tirofiban, prasugrel, aspirin. Aspirin derived balloons don't cross, so what do we do is we, in this case, uh, the microcatheter wouldn't cross either. And when that doesn't happen, uh, we move to a tornus and a tornus catheter, we use a 2.6 French tornus. We get the tornus into the mid-segment of the artery, change it for a rotor wire, and then uh, we use a 1.25 rotor burr, uh, burr it, uh, and uh, dilate and stent it. We've now got 21 cases of rotational atherectomy and ST elevation myocardial infarction, which uh, have all gone without any problems. We've used 1.25 burrs in most of these cases and 1.5 burrs in two of these cases. But what is important to note is that we're using 190,000 revolutions per minute to 200,000 revolutions per minute in these patients. Um, 
Heavily calcified lesions, again, can cause failure to cross, and here is a patient with an occluded right and an occluded left. Uh, we, we tried everything. Once the wire was in, we tried everything again, and nothing would go. So here we used a, a uh, this is how we, we tried everything. We couldn't anchor anything, because once the anchoring wire was in, we couldn't get any balloon to go into the conus branch. Um, we tried a tornus. Uh, this tornus is a 2.6 French tornus, and it's a great tornus to use. Uh, once we had it in there, we could exchange it for a rotor wire and completing the case. And what is important, a little bit about the tornus. What have I learned? You cannot inject into a tornus. You need to trap it into the guide uh, to retrieve it, and that's how you trap it over there, like with a balloon dilated in that distal part of the guiding catheter. And it's difficult to exchange a rotor wire with a 2.1 French. So we have stopped using 2.1 French in our practice. We only keep 2.6 French, and we've requisited a tornus pro, which will allow us better revolutions and, uh, and, and more freedom to do a little longer rotation rather than just the 30, which we get from our tornus. 2.6 French currently. Um, this is the LED of that same gentleman, uh, lady, and this is a calcified bifurcation, which is an LED, and here we had the tonus also failing to us. So every device that we tried, we're scaling it up, and we're not able to do it. So something go back to your basics, and what we did 20 years ago in the cath lab is we took in a balloon and we just jackhammered the lesion for 20 minutes. So here we took in a 1.5 balloon or 1.25 balloon and just hammered the, the proximal cap of the lesion on the wire for 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, we went and put in our tornus again, made a channel, put in a microcatheter, and once we had a microcatheter in, it was easy to do a exchange it for a rotor wire, we put in a burr into the LED, we burred the diagonal branch, and once we burred the diagonal branch, it was easy to get this with a provisional standing. We went on to diagonal, we go ahead and do the 111 left main after that, and this lady is doing well as well. Thank you for those things. It can go a long way, but I'll stop here. Thanks.